So I'm going to introduce Mina. So this is Mina Vicera, and she is the Nursery and Landscape Specialist for Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. She has worked with CCE since 2013 to serve Long Island's horticultural professionals by coordinating educational programming and assisting with plant health care issues through research and consultations. And this evening, she is going to tell us about all of the fun things that Cornell actually is a resource for. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Thanks Thank to uh, Rewild for having me this evening. So I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. And thanks for joining me. Um, as Kimberly said, my name is Mina Vicera, and I am I'm an extension educator and I serve landscape professionals. So my other title is the nursery landscape professional or nursery landscape specialist. And so this evening, um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about Cooperative Extension, the organization that I work for. And normally when I give this talk, I have a subtitle of ever hear of it, because usually people uh, have never heard of it, <laughs> um, except for partnering organizations or folks within academia. Most people kind of give me the hum when I kind of tell them my title of extension educator. But tonight, let's see, so let me go forward. There we go. Um, I'm going to be discussing how you can access cooperative extension, um, either as a home gardener or as a parent or someone that is interested in learning about energy efficiency. So cooperative extension is accessible for all sorts of reasons. So we're really going to get into it tonight. <laughs> um, so first, you know, I have to give you a little bit of background, you know, how, why, you know, why did cooperative extension um, initially become established? Who started this, this concept? And then, of course, what it is in New York State, how you can access it, what sort of educational programming, programming is offered. Um, after I end this presentation, we're going to explore the website for CCE Suffolk and then CCE Nassau. Um, the two cooperative extensions here on Long Island. And then we're going to do a Q&A. You know, I think if you have um, a Q&A on a certain slide that I that is up, you know, feel free to just kind of raise your hand or you can even unmute yourself because if you're anything like me, sometimes I ask a question. If I don't write it down, it kind of slips my mind, um, but also you can just put it into chat. So here's the, the history that we're going to start with, and we're going to start with a timeline of cooperative extension because it's important to kind of know that the roots of something to gain a different type of appreciation for it. At least that's how I like to view it. So let's kind of focus on the first bullet point there, and I'll also kind of highlight some of the other text that um, you can focus on this slide, which has quite a bit of information on it. So the first thing we're going to discuss is this concept of teaching by demonstration. And that is credited to a gentleman um, named Dr. Seaman Knapp. And that date there, um, 1833, that's the year he was born. <laughs> so I thought I'd showcase that. Um, and he was, you know, quite a gentleman. Um, he certainly accomplished a lot in his lifetime. And later in his life is when he really became passionate about agriculture, about farming, and about teaching about farming. So when he, he was born in New York, but then he moved to the Midwest and he had a farm in Ohio, I believe. And so there he um, of course realized that number one, it's hard being a farmer. Um, it takes a lot and um, it costs a lot as well, a lot of money to farm the land and to make a profit out of it. And so he was looking for some courses in farming um, to kind of continue his education on it. And he learned that uh, Michigan State, they were providing this, these type of courses where they were teaching farmers um, certain practices to better their uh, production. And so he kind of took that idea and really expanded it and ran with it. And so his goal was to basically improve the methods of farming, not only for the environment, but for also uh, 
the livelihood of farmers as well. And he realized that model farms, farms that are established, say, by universities, aren't always effective teaching tools. So he really wanted to get the farmer fully involved and immersed in this idea of learning new practices, but not only learning them, but adopting them, because that's always the key. So I'm going to read this quote um, that is credited to him, and I just love it. Um, what a man hears, he may doubt. You know, what he sees, he may possibly doubt. But what he does himself, he cannot doubt. So he took this concept of teaching by demonstration to farmers across the entire United States. And from his work of taking a question of what's the best fertilizer to use for my crop and having the farmers test that themselves on their farm, from this work that was being done, he published it and made it available to farmers all across the country. Um, so you can find a lot of his work within you know, the USDA archives. Now, I believe um, Dr. Knapp, he passed away at the turn of the 20th century, but his son basically followed in his legacy. And I, I, I know, again, this is a lot of text on the screen here, but I'm going to read it to you because his son um, says so eloquently this idea of education through farm demonstration, and he really brings to light how the educational system really wasn't accessible to farmers as it was to other folks within the society. So in Bradford Knapp's words, during the past 12 years, a new and distinct type of agricultural education has been established in America. And this is in 20, I mean, rather in 1916 that this article was published. This new and practical plan of disseminating information may now be regarded as part of the educational system of the country. It introduces a method by which those who do not attend schools are able to learn a method by which, excuse me, are able to learn while they still pursue the busy work of their everyday struggle for a living. So far as agriculture and the rural problem are concerned, this system of education has given a new meaning to the phrase, knowledge and the means of education shall be free forever. It is rapidly giving to all rural people an equal opportunity to acquire useful knowledge without needless sacrifice of time. While the public school system brought some training in primary branches of learning within reach of the masses, it required the pupil to seek the education and confined its effort mainly to the youth of the land. Schools, colleges, and universities necessarily withdraw the student from active life and from gainful occupations. Educational faculties or educational facilities supplied by these necessary and useful parts of our system are still found mainly within the walls of the institution. Above the primary grades, education has been, after all, a thing for the few rather than for the masses. So basically what his father and himself were um, promoting was continuing education. And nowadays, continuing education is just secondhand. You know, anyone that holds a professional license needs to continue their education in order to remain um, informed of the latest research that affects their field and affects decisions that they need to make within their field. So at the turn of the century, this idea of informing farmers of the best practices that they can use to revolutionize their farming was, you know, was life-saving because it brought the teaching to the farmers and the farmers themselves became the educators. And because they were actually doing these practices and teaching fellow farmers, many of the practices that were done were actually um, becoming adopted. So from this teaching by demonstration, uh, Dr. Seaman Knapp also pioneered the idea of the experiment stations and land grant universities, which really kind of housed this whole concept of teaching by demonstration, um, working with farmers and um, providing uh, land as well for researchers from the university to conduct to conduct trials. Um, so in 1862, 
Dr. Knapp proposed a law to fund <laughs> some of these ideas. Of course, uh, federal, funding, federal funding is very important um, and appreciated. And if federal funding wasn't available, probably a lot of these ideas wouldn't have um, taken a foothold within our history. Um, are you folks aware of land-grant universities? A lot of times when I give this talk, people aren't aware of land-grant universities. I pretty much attended nothing but land-grant universities in my education. Um, but these land-grant universities, usually the state universities, and for New York State, that's Cornell University, which was um, granted the um, basically the identification as the school that would house this kind of teaching by demonstration technique. And it essentially um, gave these colleges the responsibility to work with the community and to extend the research that was done at the university out to the community. And so it, it was based primarily in agriculture, but then as you'll learn, my lights are turning off, but as you'll learn, it also kind of went into other aspects of the community. <laughs> so I'm trying to turn my light back on. Um, all right, so other aspects um, of history that are important just to be aware of, uh, two other important acts that were passed at the federal government which allowed funding. Um, and as I said, and I want to emphasize, funding is really important in terms of the establishment and the continuation of cooperative extension. So in 1887, the Hatch Act was passed and that provided federal support for a national experiment um, agricultural stations across the United States. And we'll kind of explore that further in just a few moments. And then in 1914, the Smith-Lever Act that took this teaching by demonstration concept and turned it into a nationwide cooperative extension system. And, you know, I really want to emphasize the word cooperative because it really involves um, a lot of organizations and a lot of communities. And so to date, uh, cooperative extension, the national cooperative extension is over 100 years old. It turned 100 years old in 1914. Um, Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County, we turned 100 years old in 19, or um, rather in 2017. So we've been around for a long time. That's why, you know, I'm always surprised. Oh, people don't know us, but at the same time, um, I can understand why people aren't fully aware of us. So the images that you see on the screen, that is of the experiment station, the agricultural experiment station here on Long Island. And we should all feel fortunate that we actually have an experiment station here on Long Island. There are, I think about three others in New York State and it was important to put one here on Long Island because we have such a different climate compared to the rest of the state. Um, you are more than welcome to visit the experiment station. It's called the Long Island Horticultural Research and Extension Center. You know, certainly agricultural experiments are conducted because there's a lot of vegetable farming that happens here on Long Island, but there's a lot of ornamental horticulture that happens here on Long Island as well. So there's going to be a lot of trials are conducted. This here is a trial of annuals conducted by our floriculture specialist and our agriculture program director, Nora Catlin. There's over 60 acres of fields that are used to trial different um, cultivars of potato. There's a vineyard. Um, I conduct trials on ornamental woody plants. Uh, our weed scientists would conduct trials on weed management. So there's a whole lot of going on. And all this information, of course, is disseminated to the growers or to landscape professionals. And they themselves are the ones that initiate the research because they're the ones asking the questions. So this idea of cooperative extension um, is basically based in the concept that the work that is done at the university level, the research I should say that is done at the, at the university level, at these um, experimental stations, at these agricultural experimental stations, the work that is done on farms with the research and the farmers, all of this is linked to folks in the community. So whoever that is, whether it's the farmer, whether it's parents trying to understand the best way to raise their children, um, whether it's folks that have diabetes and they wanna know what the best sort of um, nutritional plan they should follow. All of that is based in research and it is shared through them 
um, through all these organizations that kind of create this cooperative extension. And believe it or not, there are 62 extension associations in New York State. Essentially, there's one in every county. And the reason why the we offer information you can trust there is kind of highlighted is because all the information that we offer is based in scientific experimentation. And we're you know truly not trying to sell you anything. Can I add something to the LIRAC Center? Of course. Hi, um, my name is Carol Brown. I'm um, part of a volunteer group called Cornell Gardeners. Oh, yes. At the, at the center, at the Lyric Center, there's probably about four acres of other types of gardens there that us volunteers have been taking care of for 10, 20 years. Um, all different types of gardens, from cottage garden to pollinator garden to native garden to veggie garden to herb garden um uh evergreen um so we meet on tuesday mornings and um we are always happy to have more people join us in our gardens because it makes us happy and we also do a um an annual house second weekend in um july free and we'll take you all around the, uh, the gardens. Wonderful. Thank you, Carol, for mentioning that. Yes. So there's, you know, there's a lot going on in terms of research, but then there's also certainly all sorts of demonstration projects that happen at the research lab as well. So either uh, reach out to Carol or reach out to Mark Bridgen. He is the director of the research lab, and he would love <laughs> for you to volunteer your time to become a Cornell gardener. Now, Cornell Cooperative Extension is a nonprofit association, and as in any nonprofit association, we have a mission statement that guides our uh, that guides our programming. And the overarching mission statement for Cornell Cooperative Extension is uh, we put knowledge to work. And I really love this simple phrase of putting knowledge to work um, because it kind of takes the idea of, you know, you have knowledge that can be used for just kind of and trivia, you know, I don't know if any of you go to these trivia nights that are at breweries or um, at anything really. So that's, you know, certainly useful knowledge to have. But the knowledge that we produce here at Cooperative Extension and, and the, that the growers produce in cooperation with us is really knowledge that you put to work and it benefits the community. So it benefits the economic um, vitality of the community, the ecological sustainability, and the overall social well being. And as mentioned in the timeline, this is a nationwide network. So there's a Cornell Cooperative Extension, but then um, where I'm from in Rhode Island, the University of Rhode Island has a Cooperative Extension. So that Cooperative Extension is very directly associated with the university. Um, Virginia Cooperative Extension, you name it, there is one in every single state, um, Hawaii, uh, and there's also cooperative extensions in other parts of the world as well. Uh, many times when I'm looking for information on certain studies, I, you know, I realize that Australia has a great uh, cooperative extension if they just call it something different. Um, and Canada as well has a want, has wonderful research that's being done in ornamental horticulture. And whenever you see pictures of cooperative extension in action, it's always with people. And many times, you know, whether it's children or whether it's done on a farm with livestock, um, I had to include this pretty picture of potatoes in bloom, but it's always, it always involves the community. Now I mentioned to, I think it was Gloria, uh, that I was gonna comment on how I became involved in Cooperative Extension. And for me, it was kind of multifaceted. I didn't find out about Cooperative Extension until I went to college. I went to college at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and I studied forestry. And some of the professors within that department had an extension appointment. You know, you have professors that strictly have a teaching appointment, um, but then you have professors that also have an extension appointment. And that means that some of the research that they conduct is to answer questions from people in the industry. And so within the department that I was in, the Department of Natural Resources, the forestry professors that I worked with were conducting research that directly benefit or answer questions from loggers and forestry uh, professionals within that area. 
So that was kind of my initial introduction to cooperative extension. And I really admired what my what my professors were doing because I, I saw that they were able to still kind of be educators, but then they also got to do research and they got to work with the community. So three things that I was very curious about and I wanted to somehow combine. When I became a landscape professional myself, um, I fell in love with plants. <laughs> and so I dove into ornamental horticulture and I moved to Maine and I became a gardener. And so I wanted to know everything in everything under the sun about um, about gardening. So I learned about the soils labs and how you could really understand what was going on with the soils underfoot and how um, the chemicals, the elements within that soil could be lacking or could be in excess. So I learned so much just by sampling two cups of soil <laughs> and finding out what was happening um, underfoot. And when I lived in Maine, I also attended master gardener classes. You know, I had a degree in forestry, but yet I ended up working in ornamental horticulture. So there was more I needed to learn. And the master gardener courses that I took at UMaine were wonderful because they really gave me a continuing education <laughs> that I that I needed to help me in my professional career. And I also encountered diseases and pests while I was a gardener that I didn't understand. And, you know, before you spray, you should always find out what that pest is. And so I used the diagnostic lab at UMaine. Um, I only had to pay a little, a little fee, just, you know, a, a small fee. And they gave me an answer and recommendation on how to treat that responsibly. So once I became exposed to cooperative extension, I was always seeking and seeking them out because I realized how helpful they were. And so when I got to the point where I wanted to continue my education, I realized I want to work for extension. <laughs> so I um, found out how to do it. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And I decided to, um, you know, go for a career in extension. So now I want to ask you in the audience, um, how many of you are familiar with cooperative extension and you know what does it mean to you and you can feel free to unmute yourself or you know go ahead and um you know put it in chat i can see if i because now i'm i have chat open so i can see what folks write so i'm just going to take a minute and i'm going to see you know who of you in the audience are familiar with cooperative extension i know some of you are um, and what it means to you you know, do you use it just for soil testing, for example? Do you use the diagnostic lab? So some people have heard about it over the years. Um, it makes you think about education, about planting. Anybody else want to share? I have two more bullets. <laughs> That'd be great to uh, get two more talking points on that. Yeah, a lot of people, they just weren't, weren't aware of cooperative extension. So I hope I really do um, introduce it to some of you. So someone wrote that Cornell Cooperative Extension advised our neighborhood group about restoration in coastal areas. Yeah, that's a question that I um, get asked a lot about as well. And I offered a, a course in it last year because I wanted to learn more about it. And I knew the community wanted to learn more about it as well. All right. So... Now, in terms of looking at the uh, mission statement of Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County, you know, it's very similar to kind of, you know, putting knowledge to work, but we just kind of expanded that a little bit. So, you know, basically what our mission statement says is we want to strengthen families and communities. We want to support them and we want to support them while also protecting the environment and protecting their bottom line. You know, for farmers, if farmers don't make a livelihood, if they don't make some sort of profit from farming, then they can't farm. So we want to make sure that any sort of practice that we recommend also is feasible economically um, within their business plan. And, you know, promoting sustainable agriculture is listed separately. You know, that could easily be, um, you know, part of strengthening families and communities, because here in Suffolk County, agriculture is a big part of the community here. But, you know, I think this is kind of a call out to what historically Cooperative Extension was all about, which was working with farmers. 
there are many departments within the CCE Suffolk Association, so our organization. And I'm just highlighting a few here, but I'll go through more of them as I bring up the website. So here we have the Agriculture Department. That's the department that I work in, my nursery landscape or community horticulture program. 4-H Youth and Development, um, that's how I know a lot of people have uh, become aware of extension when they were kids, they took part in the 4-H youth development programs. Um, we have a marine department because, you know, we're on an island, <laughs> but not all the associations across New York State, they don't all have marine departments. Um, and then community education is a family health and wellness program. And once we go on the CC NASA website, you'll notice that they have different departments than what we have here at Cooperative Extension, and that's continued across the entire state. So it's not that every Cooperative Extension in Cornell has the same departments. No, they all differ because it's all determined by the needs of the community. I love kind of showing what we do in pictures as well. You know, so you can see it in words, but it's really great to kind of see it in pictures. So this is just, um, a snapshot really of what some of we offer. So, and this is for ornamental horticulture because that's the program that I'm a part of. Um, so up top here, we have some programs that were offered to educate farmers about native bees and how to promote native bees within your farming production system. These two images here, the top and the bottom, these were educational programs that I offered for landscape architects. Uh, landscape architects are wonderful in terms of designing amazing, beautiful, functional landscapes. But in college, they don't really learn too much about the plant material, about what plants do well in certain areas horticulturally. And so my program kind of expands their plant palette. <laughs> and um, it's wonderful because they're a great group of people and they appreciate the knowledge that they're receiving that they can then put to work. Um, here we have Marge Daughtry and Dan Gilrain. Marge is the ornamental plant pathologist and Dan Gilrain is the entomologist here um, at Cooperative Extension. Margie has a state extension appointment. Um, so she's the ornamental plant pathologist for the entire state. And combined, the two of them have over 50 years of experience here on Long Island. Um, wealth of knowledge, these two. And this was at Bayard Cutting at a program on invasive plants. Uh, here is um, a demonstration about electronic equipment for managing someone's yard, managing um, turf grass. Uh, there's many towns, as you know, that are trying to pass regulations to limit the use of gas powered um, gas powered equipment because you know they're very polluting. Uh, so. I thought, okay, we'll bring these folks in. My industry has questions. They can ask some of the experts on this type of equipment. Uh, soil sampling, of course, is always popular for Cooperative Extension. I think that's another way that folks actually become aware of Cooperative Extension is through soil sampling. And I was working with a grower here and we were just collecting soil samples from his tree production. Um, this, these last two images that I'll discuss is about research and demonstration. So again, uh, kind of what Cooperative Extension is truly based in. We were um, at a nursery. I conduct a lot of research at nurseries and cooperatively, of course, with the grower. <laughs> and we were testing different fertilizer rates uh, to grow the various trees that are produced here on Long Island. And this last image is a garden that looks different now, uh, that's at the Long Island Horticultural Research and Extension Center, but it was initially installed as a demonstration to show alternatives to invasive ornamental plants. I said I would kind of briefly go over my own position and some of the requirements of my position. Uh, so a uh, minimum requirement for Cornell Cooperative Extension across the entire state in order to become an extension educator, we used to be called agents as well, but that's not a very friendly word. Um, usually people kind of equate agents with compliance and that's more of a regulatory type of position. We are educators. So that's why they pretty much changed it to extension educators because our primary role is um, education outreach. And so um, for my role, you need a minimum of a master's degree. And the whole purpose of that master's degree is basically to teach you how to conduct research and um, 
you have to be able to teach as well and enjoy teaching. So I have to be able to create educational programming. So that's everything from running conferences to uh, teaching to writing fact sheets. And of course you have to have good communication skills. You have to like talking to people and um, in all sorts of ways. So both written and verbal. And my program is very self-directed. Um, I don't have anyone pretty much telling me what to do except the industry, uh, the green industry kind of directs how I should run my program. I serve a large group of landscape professionals. So I love it. It's highly varied and um, it keeps me on my toes and it keeps my program very diverse. So it's everyone from nursery growers, landscapers, arborists, landscape architects, landscape designers, municipalities. There's just so many groups of people that not that I don't even mentioned here that I am able to work with. And I learned so much from them. Um, it's a wonderful relationship that we have. And there is also a community horticulture specialist. So when I jump on the website, I'll show more about that as well. Now, whenever you're an, an educator working with an extension and people come to you with questions, really being an extension educator is always more about asking questions before giving answers. Because you have someone that says, you know, well, why did my plant die? And I'm sure Kimberly, Kimberly can attest to this. You know, you need to ask more questions in order to understand why that plant died. And usually it's a multitude of answers. <laughs> it's um, usually not just a pest. People love for it to be a insect pest or disease because then they can spray something or, do something maybe a little differently, but usually it's multiple things that kind of causes a plant to decline. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention that differs from Cornell Cooperative Extension to Cooperative Extensions in other states with other land-grant universities, um, usually a PhD is the minimum academic requirement. Uh, for example, when I lived in Maine, I looked into how do I become an extension educator at the University of Maine and PhD was the minimum requirement there. So it differs. Uh, you know, we do have technicians and part-time work. So there's a lot of different positions here, cooperative extension that don't require uh, a master's or PhD. I just wanted to re review a little bit the idea of the research that's conducted here at Cooperative Extension because it is truly one of the um, important you know, foundational pieces of cooperative extension. And it really, um, it really defines this statement of knowledge you can trust. So we conduct applied research and that's a very specific kind of research. And it differs from all the other kinds of research that is done within certain academic institutions or private organizations. And I just have some helpful little um, qualifiers to kind of review that. So applied research is very practical research. It's not theoretical. So basic research kind of expands upon some sort of concept, but it can take years upon years upon years of many different researchers exploring that concept. Um, you know, and goodness, how could I even give an example of like, you know, theoretical research, you know, um, quantum physics, <laughs> that's more theoretical. Um, so applied research is you have a question and you come up with an experiment to try and answer that question. And so you can either conduct that experiment within one summer and you'll provide some sort of solution or um, some sort of information to guide, you know, either a grower's um, action towards something. So it is very, very objective. Um, it's you have a, you have objectives in mind when you're conducting the research. It's geared around problem solving and improving some sort of system. I'm trying to reduce the amount of fertilizer I'm using. I'm trying to improve my soil health so I don't have to apply as much water, you know, because that always affects the bottom line. Or, you know, and also importantly, it betters um, the environment. You're trying to be less polluting in your production practices versus this kind of basic research or theoretical research is advancement in an overarching knowledge of a particular concept. To give you an example of some applied research that I've conducted uh, with my colleague here, Debbie Aller, um, a lot of the growers were interested in exploring biochar, but because there wasn't too much research on biochar in ornamental plant production, 
they were coming to extension and saying, hey, can you do some trials? You know, what sort of rate would I use for my ornamental plant production if I wanted to grow a plant in containers? Um, you know, using biochar, is it beneficial? And they're asking these questions because it's also really expensive. Biochar is an expensive um, supplement to their production system. So they came to us and Debbie and I applied for a grant and we decided to um, explore the use of biochar. Some of you may be asking, well, what is biochar? And basically biochar takes a waste product that would have gone to say the landfill. So for someone um, who cuts down trees for a living, or if we have a big storm and a lot of trees end up coming down, sometimes though, you know, those trees are basically chipped and those chips, a lot of them end up in the wolf, um, in the landfill or they sit on someone's lot for a long, long time. So what you can do instead with these wood chips or any type of bio waste that um, you can divert that track to the landfill and you can turn it into biochar. And biochar is a very, carbon rich material and it's a very stable source of carbon and it provides um, several benefits that are backed by research and the way it's made is you cook this organic material right this what was once um, either wood or you can use um, a sugar cane bagasse you can use waste from making wine, uh, even twine that's used in agricultural production. Uh, organic twine, the twine that breaks down, is used in making biochar. You can use all this organic bio waste and you can cook it. <laughs> Basically, it's cooked in this pyrolysis stove, essentially. And pyrolysis is chemical decomposition at very, very hot temperatures. So I'm talking like 1400 degrees Celsius. And it's done in near absence of oxygen. So these kind of furnaces that are used to create this biochar is um, very expensive equipment. You can also kind of create a backyard pyrolysis furnace with uh, a, a, a metal barrel, but there, you know, you have a little bit more oxygen that's in play there. So that's why I like to say the near absence of oxygen. And if you can't tell, what you put into this pyrolysis furnace basically comes out looking what it did before, except it's completely black because what you're left with is basically just carbon. Uh, you know, activated carbon, what you have in your uh, water filters, it's a very similar substance. <laughs> it's just, you know, pretty much 100% carbon. There are some other chemicals. There's a little bit of phosphorus uh, usually involved. Unfortunately, sometimes with some of these bio waste, you can get an accumulation of heavy metals that ends up being part of biochar. So that's why it's always good to know what supplement or what amendment you're using. Um, and usually if you're interested in biochar, you can ask the manufacturer for an analysis. So you know, excuse me, um, if there's excessive lead, for example, within this biochar. But it is a great uh, soil amendment because it increases soil moisture, it increases, uh, increases the ability of the soil to retain moisture, and it also increases the ability of the soil to retain nutrients. And it's because of the chemical structure of this, uh, of this product and how it went under that chemical decomposition. And uh, this carbon has an amazing ability to um, support soil health. And it's a completely different topic, but I just wanted to introduce it to you because like I said, the growers were questioning it. So we explored it together. And, um, you know, unfortunately our study basically didn't find that it was useful in terms of container production, especially for the bottom line. Um, I, I have this picture up on the screen because I just wanted to show that what goes into the pyrolysis furnace basically comes out looking the same. So this was an apple that was stuck in the pyrolysis furnace and it still looks like an apple, right? So that chemical decomposition is at the chemical molecular level. It's not definitely, uh, it's not changing the overall structure of what goes in, it changes at the molecular level. And that's what um, partly makes it so amazing. So we tested it for um, improving soil moisture retention and nutrient retention. And other studies have shown that it is effective 
But our results essentially um, showed that at the rates we were using, 5, 10, and 15 tons per acre, um, that it didn't show consistent results. So that's key. So we couldn't recommend rates to our growers because more studies need to be done. And that was both in containers and in the field. So this is just an example of the type of biochar that we used. And many of you can probably guess, well, that looks like wood chips. And that's exactly what it was. Um, the growers wanted us to use wood chips because it is very accessible. And other studies have shown that wood chip biochar had many benefits within agricultural production. So these are just images of um, what installing a trial looks like and some of the tools that we had to use in order to um, test for efficacy of the biochar. Here we're applying our treatments. We did continually measure soil moisture with uh, wonderful sensors that are underground. <laughs> so it takes a lot of work to install these triers, trials and it takes you know wonderful cooperation from the growers. Um, this is at a nursery out on the North Fork. We installed lysimeters to kind of capture the soil water that was going through the soil profile to test how um, what level of nutrients were leaching through that soil profile. So wonderful study. We learned a lot from it, but not all studies give you concrete results. Um, so that's why, you know, we just have to continually try sometimes in exploring these questions in a different way. All right, so now what I'm going to do um, is pretty much uh, go on the website. So here I have a snapshot of the Cornell Cooperative Extension Suffolk County website and the Nassau website, and I am going to stop sharing my screen um, for this presentation and I'm going to go to my browser. Let's see, here it is. And we are going to um, explore the website because the best way to kind of show you how to navigate the extension system and how you can um, access people to answer your questions is by going on the website. Okay, I'm just gonna hide that again. All right, so hopefully you all can see this. Uh, right now I'm on the Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County website. And here are the various departments that are within our association. So I'm in the agriculture department. Um, this is the horticulture, the commercial horticulture program. So these are some of the resources I offer. Uh, the, horticulture, the horticulture resource guide, wonderful. Um, Wonderful resource. There's lots of different uh, plant lists within this guide. Of course, it's not coming up now. <laughs> um, that's really strange, uh, possibly because I'm not sharing that screen. Um, but anyway, you know, certainly explore this website. There's a lot of information. What I'm going to focus on right now is the gardening, because I think most of you um, are home gardeners, whereas I said before, the agriculture in my program is primarily for either farmers or landscape professionals. So if we go to the gardening link, if you go all the way to the bottom of the page, you'll see the contact person. So Roxanne Zimmer is the community horticulture specialist, and you can feel free to give her a call or shoot her an email if you have any sort of question um, regarding educational programming. Um, or just about plants in general, um, she'll be happy to talk to you. Or if you wanted to get a program started within your community about school gardens, um, anything, just reach out to her and she'll be happy to help. Um, so within the gardening section, you have all these um, other tabs that you can access. So let's go to the Horticulture Diagnostic Lab. The Horticulture Di Di Diagnostic Lab just celebrated its 50 years of service the last year. And the way home gardeners can use this lab is by accessing them with all sorts of plant questions that they have. You have spots on your plants, what's going on? Well, you can email the two wonderful women um, at this lab. One of them is Alice Ramundo. She's one of the horticulture consultants and her contact information is there. And then there's also another horticulture consultant, um, Sandra Voltaggio, and they have over 30 years experience combined. Um, they help a lot of people every year troubleshoot what's going on within their garden. So you can send them pictures, you can mail them samples, you can go to the office if you're in Suffolk, um, if it's nearby. We're located at 423 Griffin Avenue. All the information is here on the website. They do have um, a garden hotline that you can call them at as well. Um, beginning um, in April through October, there's a seasonal um, horticulture diagnostic lab that opens up at Bayer Cutting Arboretum. 
So folks that are in Western Suffolk, if it's easier to go to Bayard Cutting Arboretum, you can go there as well. That office is only open Thursday and Fridays. Um, so again, um, if you're not sure, just give them a call before you come out to the office. Um, but lots of things can be um, troubleshooted. So you have an insect, a spider, a tick, you wanna know what it is. Just go to the website and they'll be able to help you. Soil testing that's done here at the diagnostic lab. You can find out pH or electrical conductivity. That's basically the salt levels within your soil. Uh, it's for a very reduced fee as well. I know they have new prices, but it's basically around 10 bucks per soil sample, possibly even less. Um, but usually it's around, you know, five to I think $15 for any of these type of issues that you may have. And of course you can send them pictures too online. Um, if you would like a more involved soil analysis, say the complete chemical analysis, you wanna know your phosphorus, your magnesium, your calcium levels, that cannot be done at the horticulture diagnostic lab, but they can can direct you. So Alice or Sandra can direct you how to do that. Um, so here on the website as well, there's information on how home gardeners can send samples to other labs that do conduct those kind of soil sampling services. Um, so other information here that I want to show you on the gardening website um, are the horticultural fact sheets. So let's see if I can find them. Let's see, da, 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 da. let me go to, maybe it was on the horticulture lab. Oops. Here we go, the horticulture fact sheets. There is a ton of information here. Um, you know, you can just kind of scroll down the column here. You're interested in growing tree fruit. You're interested in growing, um, in understanding tree and shrub insect pests. So lots of information to explore. So just take some time to check these out. Um, as I mentioned before, there's the Marine Program. The Marine Program offers excellent educational programming. Um, you're interested in learning how to plant eel, eel grass, very important in terms of coastal stabilization. They have workshops for that. I don't know why these pictures aren't coming up. Um, I took a I took a fun art class with the marine program here where we made artwork using seaweed. That was a lot of fun. Um, so <laughs> Again, just wonderful activities that are offered both to the professional level because the marine program, of course, also works with fisher uh, people that you know fish for a living. Um, there's aquatic fisheries as well, so it's a very broad program. But they absolutely, um, uh, you know, provide educational programming for residents as well. I don't want to discount uh, Suffolk County Farm if you've never been there go there. It is so much fun. Um, they have baby animals coming up pretty soon. You know, springtime is baby animals time, but there's a lot of fun events that they do. They do provide a lot of educational programming there just in terms of um, raising cattle or this is not my field of expertise, but raising animals in general. Um, they have goats, they have pigs, they have sheep. Uh, you can do goat yoga there. You know, I would never want to do that, but some people like that. So if you want to explore that, you can certainly do that. Uh, here's 4-H, we discussed that. Um, and then the Conic Dunes is a camp that's out here on the North Fork and it's geared towards children. So so much going on here with Cooperative Extension of, of Suffolk County. Now I'm going to go to, hopefully it will, can you all see the uh, Nassau County website? Can somebody just shout out? I wanna make sure that it's switched to that tab yes. and you can, okay, wonderful. So if you look at the top tab over here, you know, it's not the same as it was for Suffolk County. So they do have a horticulture tab and that is for both landscape professionals, but also home gardeners. So they provide soil testing as well. Um, again, it is not the complete chemical analysis. It's not soil health testing that the Cornell lab does as well. It's the pH and the soluble salts, the electrical conductivity. Um, so they have um, different tabs because it's all geared towards what sort of questions they got from their community over time. So they have a great tab here for compost resources, um, quick start in terms of home composting in your backyard. Uh, I love that they have this energy and environment tab. Uh, so of course it talks about climate change. Um, oh, they discuss ponds, that's really cool. Let's see what that's about. I've always wanted to put a, a pond in my yard. It's, you know, having water is one of the best ways to 
um, introduce diverse wildlife. You know, of course, it's wonderful to have native plants in your yard and plants that support habitat. But if you don't have water, uh, you won't welcome as much uh, as much wildlife to your to your yard. Okay, so the pictures aren't coming up. I'm sorry about that. That must be kind of a quirk with Zoom. But um, you know the community education that I didn't fully go over with the Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County website, we'll explore it here. They call their community education, nutrition, health, and wellness. And so again, you're a parent and you want the best information of parenting, or if you want nutritional information, um, Cornell Cooperative Extension is kind of uh, the place to go. And it is rooted in those home economic programs, you know, canning. I think every single Cooperative Extension in the United States likely still offers a course on how to can properly. I've always wanted to take it. <laughs> I have yet to take it. I've, I've done it just by learning on my own and with friends, but I've always wanted to take a canning course with Cornell Cooperative Extension because similar to it being based in agricultural outreach, um, it's also based in making sure that families can support themselves through the winter and canning was one of those important ways to be able to support your family through hard times. So, um, you know, I, I hope that this presentation kind of gave you a great general overview of Cooperative Extension. It made you appreciate where we came from and where we're going. And I hope that you all take advantage of us <laughs> and explore the cooperative extension that's in your area, whether you live in Nassau Con County or Suffolk County, there's pretty much um, something for everyone. And if you go on the website, there's always this event box here and you can just see all the different programming that is being offered. I know when Roxanne Zimmer, for example, uh, she's a community horticulture specialist. When she does programs at libraries across Suffolk County, it will be listed within the events programming. So check it out, explore it, give us a call. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have a question about something. I will make sure that you're directed to the right person that will be able to answer your question. So thank you very much for your time. With that, I'm happy to take any questions that you have now. <laughs> Sure, it looks like we have a couple here. So the first one is going to be from Nancy. And she asks, is the tradition of burning farm fields and roadsides as in Panama a way of making biochar? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, so um, biochar was historically made um, you know, in South America, that's kind of where the origin of biochar comes from, was from burning. You know, once agricultural fields kind of lost their productivity, uh, burning was introduced to kind of invigorate those soils. So as I mentioned, it does produce a very stable form of carbon and carbon, the carbon cycle, you know, it's incredibly important in terms of um, improving the productivity and soil health of the land. So yes, uh, they don't do that here though. Uh, you know, on Long Island, very tricky to do burns. Um, they have introduced prescribed burns within our forests. So that's wonderful because again, it's a very important tool, but if you want to introduce biochar to say your production or your garden, you can buy a bag. You can buy a bag of it and just uh, incorporate it into your soil that way. Uh, let's see, we have, what are some of the most frequently asked questions that you receive? What are some of the most frequently asked questions that I receive? You know, a lot of it is seasonal. I get a lot of pest management questions. So again, I work with uh, landscape professionals. So they will frequently send pictures of uh, plant symptoms. You know, why does this boxwood have these spots, for example, and what can I do about it? <laughs> you know, that's always, they want to know what it is, but more importantly, what can they do about it so the plant no longer has those spots. And so I work a lot with Daniel Rain, the extension entomologist, and Marjorie Daughtry, the ornamental plant pathologist, and we kind of troubleshoot. But something that I see all the time whenever I do site visits, because part of my job is to do site visits with say landscapers or arborists and we troubleshoot um, a situation that's happening in the landscape. Um, I see a lot of de deep planting of trees. And that is one of the most detrimental things you can do to the health of a tree because it completely stresses out the tree. And so then that stress is given off as a chemical response and that attracts all sorts of insect pests and it makes the tree more susceptible to disease as well. Yes. 
Um, this is coming up a lot because people are looking for um, garden designers and landscapers that actually work with native plants and are actually green friendly. Um, do you recommend anybody or is that something you're allowed to do? You know, if somebody asks me, uh, can you recommend an arborist, just as an example, and I'll answer mm -hmm. your question in a second. I usually direct them to the Long Island Arboricultural Association website because they have a list of um, arborists that are members. So that's one way where I can suggest an arborist, for example. In terms of like landscape ecologists, it's not a large group of people here on Long Island. And so I do kind of have a running list of landscape ecologists that you know, I say, hey, if you know someone else that can be added to the list, just let me know and I'll add them. But I do share that list with folks um, like, if, like, if um, requested. Like landscape, like we're looking for like green landscape maintenance people along yep. that line also. Yeah, okay. okay. So, you know, they are landscape ecologists and they will, you know, do a site visit and inform you, kind of do a habitat assessment. Nice. Um, they'll let you know if you have invasive plants in the yard. And, and you know, some of them do not do landscape maintenance, but mm -hmm. they will uh, direct you, they'll give you a plan. And so then you can hire a landscaping company and you say, this is exactly what I want you to do. I know there are some companies that are using electronic equipment, for example, when doing lawn care. So you just have to ask those questions to the people that you're considering um, as your landscape provider. Okay. Um, can you give us advice as to the best way to handle when neighbors spray for ticks and or grubs? What can I do in my yard to keep attracting toads, butterflies, birds, et cetera? That's a great question. And I think one thing to do is just open that line of communication, you know, talk to your neighbor and ask them what was applied. Uh, also, um, there is such thing as neighbor notification. So for certain chemicals that are applied by a chemical, by a pesticide applicator, they need to put outside the property these little yellow signs. You've probably seen them all um, about in your neighborhood. And so those little yellow signs will, I believe they tell you what was applied, but they also, um, I don't think they tell you what was applied, but it gives you an idea that something was applied. <laughs> but usually um, for certain restricted products, restricted pesticide products, and the New York State DEC are the ones who determine which chemicals are restricted use. Um, if those are used on a property, they need to notify the neighbor. But there are some products where no neighbor notification isn't necessary because the products are deemed reduced risk. So, you know, this is why if you see a pesticide applicator or an arborist company that's at a property and they have their gun out there, you know, their, their applicator gun, and you're wondering what is being applied, you know, and you weren't notified, just have the conversation with your neighbor to find out what was being applied. Because sometimes it's just fertilizer that they're applying, um, some sort of slow release fertilizer. Biochar can be applied that way too, believe it or not. Um, injections, you know, usually fertilizers are done with injections as well. But I think the best thing you can do is just have the conversation. You can also, um, can't you also ask them for their EPA list for what they're spraying, the business itself? Oh, so if the, if the pesticide applicator is there mm -hmm. doing the application, they should have the label on hand. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's one of the requirements. And it's always, you know, anyone who's doing a pesticide application to a private property, you know, if it's not the homeowner, of course, doing it themselves, if it's a company, they have to have a pesticide license through New York State. Now, so, my, I, I'm actually want to go off on that question, too, there. So all of these businesses like Mosquito Joe and all of these new people going out there spraying, they don't have to give two weeks notice? Because I've never received it, and almost all of my neighbors use him. <laughs> well, a lot of these pestis, a lot of these mosquito companies use products that are reduced risk or considered reduced risk because of you know it's um, some sort of herbal oil or organic. Um, all yeah, natural. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, there's. Not everyone does it the right way, but exactly. I think for some of those, they don't need to do neighbor notification because of the product they're applying. Yeah. And then her second part of that question was, um, what can I do in my yard to keep attracting toads, butterflies, birds, etc.? So, yeah, wonderful. Um, 
just, you know, if you're trying to do habitat gardening, so when I say habitat gardening, you know, that means you want to attract wildlife to your garden. It doesn't mean you don't have to apply chemicals, right? You can still apply chemicals, but it's just applying them wisely and according to the label. Um, so if you decide to apply something, you know, of course, always read the label. But in terms of attracting more, just have diversity in your yard, you know, uh, the kind of you can have 100% native plants <laughs> and then you're going to attract all sorts of different uh, wildlife to your yard. You know, make sure that you have trees, that you have, um, you know, so that's the category of woody plants, trees and shrubs, uh, flowering perennials. You want to have you want to have perennials that are that are bunch forming and also that run that are mound forming. So it's great to have diversity in terms of the type of plants that are within your yard, both in terms of bloom period, but also understand that you'll attract wildlife to your yard just for having diversity of genera. So if you kind of do an assessment of your yard, one of the first things to do is get someone to identify what you have. And in order to attract the most diversity to your, to your yard, you wanna have diversity at the botanical family level. And that can be a challenging thing to do. You know, basically you wanna have three to five botanical families represented in your yard. And there's a lot of plants that are in the rose family, for example, in the yeah. aster family. So it's really easy to have a bunch of plants just in those two families. So that's one thing that you can do is just do a quick assessment of your yard. You may need a professional to do that. Or if you like doing identification on your own, that's always a lot of fun, um, is to kind of diversify at the botanical family level and then diversify in terms of bloom period and structure of the plant. And don't be so pristine. <laughs> exactly. I know this time, like this is the first time in my yard where I am not going to cut back. You know, I always leave the perennials um, the senesce stems through the winter. And usually I cut them back kind of at the beginning of April, you know, after the, the insects have woken up. But this year I'm leaving them. Yeah. You know, I'm just going to leave the stems and the perennials will grow up through them. So I'm going to try that this kind of new sustainable method of gardening. Perfect. Uh, one more question back to uh, chemicals. Does cedar oil harm natives? And does it also bother insects? Like that's a big question. People, you know, when they use all these natural items, you know, like pyrethrin and cedar oil and all of these natural chemicals. Yeah, certainly um, oils are used for pest management as well. So if there's a beneficial insect and it gets a glob of oil put on it, it may have difficulty breathing and it may die, <laughs> for example. So certainly some of these uh, chemical applications that are targeted for ticks or mosquitoes, they do have non-target um, organisms that are unfortunately end up dying as well. Yeah. So do they harm plants? Uh, I'm just gonna kind of lump it in plants uh, in general. Uh, sometimes they can, and it can be applicator error. Either the concentration was too strong or the weather conditions were wrong. I've seen burns on some plants, uh, especially uh, plants that have very tender leaves. You know, yeah. some plants, it's really difficult to have a chemical application actually stay on the leaf. It just slips right off. And of course, you know, the applicators can put a sticker within that uh, solution to get that pesticide to stick better onto the leaf and also to penetrate it better. So that can sometimes be harmful to the plant. Um, and that's why, you know, on these labels, it always says to test if it's not, if that particular plant isn't listed on the label, because yes, sometimes they can be harmful. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, here we go. Do these treatments actually work or are they ineffective? That <laughs> is a question for Moses Susura of the Suffolk County Department of Health. He has done testing on this and he's presented for me. And um, yeah, I think certainly if you have something like a permethrin that's applied, that is not uh you know, reduced risk type of product that definitely is one of those broad spectrum type of contact um, chemicals and it has a residual effect. So if you apply it, if it's applied to your yard, it lasts about three weeks or so, depending yeah. on the weather conditions. Um, 
and yeah, everything dies <laughs> within, within. Yeah, there's years. not a lot of selective insecticides, and that's yeah. the big thing that people don't realize. You're spraying for fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes, but you're killing everything. Exactly. So. You know, like certainly, of course, the ants are underground, so it's not like you're never going to see an ant if you apply a permethrin <laughs> application to your yard. But some of these oils you know, the residual effect isn't as great as using something like permethrin. Mm -hmm. um, so do they work? I think there is some data that shows they do kind of work, but, you know, ticks walk. And so they, you know, when you're using some of those uh, chemicals that have less of a residual, um, you know, they wear off. And yeah, but I, I encourage you to contact, I'll write his name. Um, I gotta see if I can spell it correctly. <laughs> so Susura, I'll kind of, I'll put his email. You know, he's a Suffolk County employee, so it's no big deal that I'm giving his, his email. <laughs> <laughs> so he's the laboratory director. And he's also a certified arborist, I just noticed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that's his office there. Yeah. So, and he continue, continues to conduct research on ticks. You know, when Tamsin has her presentation coming up, definitely ask her that question because she's more informed in terms of tests against um, tick management on how to avoid getting ticks on you. But mm -hmm. then also, you know, she will better remember what Moses has done his research because they do work closely together. Well, thank you so very much. That was fantastic. Like I said, I, there's such a resource there and just so many people are just not aware of it. And I just, yeah, absolutely. Everybody's clapping and I'm like, yes, it is. It's something everybody needs to utilize you. Absolutely. Um, yes. Come knock on our doors. Yeah. They, we want you to find us and talk to us. That's you know, everyone who works for extension really loves, loves helping work with you diagnose whatever sort of problem or issue you're having. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm just going to run through some, um, just a little of the little points here. Um, again, don't forget this coming Wednesday, March 29th, we have How to Maintain Your Spring Garden with Anthony Marinello of Drop Seed Native Plants. And on the, the oh my goodness, my brain, the 26th, um, we have the sale, the rewild plant sale starting, and that is for members only. You get 20% off that first week, so you get first dibs. And then it opens up to the public on April 3rd. Um, we have over 100 varieties of native plants on it this year. So there's a good, a nice, nice mix there. Um, and again, the Rewild Speakers Bureau meets online March 30th, which is the, um, I think it's the last Thursday of every month. And on April 6th, we have Tamsin Ye of Cornell Cooperative Extension coming in to talk about soils and mulch. I think we're all good. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so very much.